इमरान सर हाँ सर प्रिंसिपल सर सर चालीस स्टार्ट ओके ओके लेट स्टार्ट ओके या ओके सर लेट बी स्टार्ट सर यस सर यस सर या थैंक यू सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर अस्सलाम वालेकुम गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल दैट इज इन हियर इट इज माय ग्रेट प्लेजर टू बी अ मॉडरेटर फॉर इंटरनेशनल लेवल वेबिनार ऑन ग्रीन ऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट्री आई एम डॉक्टर आर इमरान खान बिगाफ ऑफ द सदाकतुल अपा कॉलेज आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सटेंड अ वार्म वेरी वेलकम टू ऑल वन ऑफ योर प्रेजेंट हियर वी अप्रिशिएट you taking a time of your busy schedules to join us today we hope you will learn a lot today based on the green organic chemistry we have a lined up for you to be a fruitful and engaging now this is the time to, to invoke the almighty my request imtiaz assistant professor department of english sadakatul afa college start this occasion with किरा ولنبلون ഫിസമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസിമോസ
Thank you. Sir, are you audible? Sir, is it audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, MTS, sir, for your presence. And to begin this program, we pleased to, to invite Dr. A. Sai Mama, sir, HODA and IQAC coordinator, Sarkatullah Pa College, Tunnel Valley, to deliver the welcome address. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, Imran. Uh, we cannot solve problems with the same thinking. We used to create them, says Albert Einstein. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to all. I deem it a great privilege to welcome the today's resource person, Professor Michael Nath, our college principal, Dr. Mohammed Sadiq, vice principal, Dr. Sayed Mohammed Kaja, HOD, faculty members, my dear colleagues, those who are here for this international webinar on green organic chemistry organized by Research Department of Chemistry. First of all, I would like to embark my speech by thanking the Almighty, the most beneficent and the most merciful. Without Him, nothing is possible. I would like to take this opportunity to express my deep sense of appreciation to our beloved correspondent, Al Hashti is Fadu Rabani, the visionary of Sadhguru College, who is all the time a moral support to us to continue our journey in the right path for the betterment of the society. I wish to express my warm welcome to committee members to this occasion. I would like to wholeheartedly welcome our beloved principal, Dr. Mohammed Sadiq, is here to inspire us with his presidential address. My heartfelt welcome to Dr. SMA Sayed Mohammed Kaja, Vice Principal, the Controller of Examination, the Deans, the Barsar, the Deputy Controller of Examination, HOD of PG Department of Chemistry, the Organizing Secretary, Dr. Imran Khan, and our department faculty members. I would like to thank each one of you for joining this international webinar. I feel great proud to say that three webinars have been organized by our department so far and has chronicled huge success. The theme of this webinar is based upon the recent trends, challenges, and opportunities. One among them is green organic chemistry. Even though this webinar is the marker of the success of our institution, it also allows us to meet one of the brilliant minds of the world. Receive the prestigious award, Descartes Prize for Excellence in Scientific Research by the European Commission in the year 2001. He has published over 220 original tickets and got six patents. His H index is 53 as on January 2021. He also got 2.2 crores from EPSRC for carbon dioxide chem 3. He also received 37 lakhs from EPSRC, Brazil Newton Fund, to establish a collaboration between his group and that of Claudia Mota at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He also received 28 crores from EPSRC for the synthesis of polymers from waste biomass, received a grant for 2 crores from Royal Society, also received a grant of 3.8 million euro from UU for the synthesis of glycerol carbonate. The great personality became the chief guest for this occasion. That is none other than Dr. Michael North, Professor of Green Chemistry, Center of Excellence, Department of Chemistry, University of York, UK. On behalf of the college and the Department of Chemistry, I welcome you, Professor. Thank, he you, got his, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. He got his first class honors BSc in chemistry from Durham University, also got DPhil from Oxford University under the guidance of Professor Sir J. E. Baldwin. He started his career as ICI Research Fellow at the University of Nottingham, working with Professor G. Patenton. He also worked as a lecturer in organic chemistry at the University of Wales, senior lecturer, and also reader of synthetic organic chemistry at KCL. He also served as a professor of organic chemistry at Newcastle University. He also as a deputy chair of EPSRC Grand Challenge Network on CO2 utilization. He also served as a visiting professor in University of Castilla, also Moscow Friendly Friendship University, and also Shanghai Technical University. His research interest is polymer chemistry, homogeneous catalysis, asymmetric catalysis, green solvents. Once again, I demand chemistry. I welcome you, sir. 
I bid a very warm welcome to participants who took out the valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this webinar. We are honored to have you all with us. I ensure that this webinar will create some beautiful memories and induce yourself to the research in the outstanding field of the green chemistry. Without taking much of your time, permit us to start the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice inspiration for the welcome speech. Now, I would like to invite a mean and a person of our college, Dr. M. Mahmoud Sadiq, sir, Principal Sadakatul Appa College, Tanalveli, want to be a deliver a presidential address. Sir, please, sir. Thank you, uh, Imran. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, sir. Sure. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, if you could count up the favors of God, never would you be able to number them. For God is all forgiving and most merciful, says the Holy Quran. Respected chief guest of this fine occasion, Dr. Uh, Professor Michael Knott, Professor of Green Chemistry, Green Chemistry Center of Excellence, Department of Chemistry, University of York, United Kingdom. Really, I feel very happy to uh, have Dr. Uh, Michael North amidst us. Such a wonderful, great personality is actually going to give a lecture on green organic chemistry. I just go through uh, his uh, profile. Really, it was uh, amazing. It is amazing that uh, he, has, he has published 420 original articles uh, in internationally reputed journals. And uh, he has got six patents and uh, his H index is 53. Such a wonderful personality is among us. And we are very gifted to have him uh, uh, to uh, have this uh, webinar on green organic chemistry. Really, I express my congratulations and hearty thanks to the organizers for inviting such a wonderful personality to our college. Respected Vice Principal of our college, Dr. Syed Mohammed Kaja. Respected uh, Head of the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Syed Mohammed. Respected faculty members of the uh, Department of Chemistry. Respected Condor of Examinations, Deputy Condor of Examinations, Dean of Arts, Dean of Sciences, and uh, Barzara of our college. Uh, really, it's a wonderful uh, arrangements for the research scholars, the students, the faculty members of our college, and, and for all the participants uh, for actually uh, presenting here in this webinar. I congratulate the total efforts taken by the department, and I pray the Almighty, Allah the Almighty, for the grand success of this program and to uh, enlighten our minds with the, with the knowledge going to be delivered by Dr. Uh, Michael Nath, a wonderful personality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for your nice speech, sir, for giving a presidential address. Now, it is my great honor to me for invite Dr. SMA Sayyid Mohammed Kaja, Vice Principal, for unaided courses, Sarakatulapa College, Tinalveli, to deliver the felicitation address. Sir, please. Yes. Good evening to everybody. And assalamu alaikum. The Almighty will show the peace and mercy to all of us. I begin the name of Almighty, the most gracious and the most benevolent. Respected and beloved our principal, Dr. M. Muhammad Sadi. Respected and honorable resource person, Professor Michael Nath. Professor of Chemistry, Green Chemistry of Excellence, Department of Chemistry, University of York, UK. Respected IQC Coordinator and Head of the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Ishayed Mohammed. Respected Dean of Arts, Dean of Science, Dean of Sciences, Control of Examinations, Deputy Control of Examinations, and Respected Dean, Research and Development, Dr. M. Sheikh Maidin Badasa, Respected ISO Coordinator, Dr. Anthony Dennis, and Respected Organizing Secretary, Dr. Adi Imran Khan. Professor of Chemistry and the faculty members of chemistry and the members from other colleagues, scholars, participants, and student friends. I am very much feel happy to participate at this international webinar on clean organic chemistry, being organized by the Department of Chemistry and to offer my felicitations on this great occasion. I congratulate the department for having selected the suitable topic and also fixed their wonderful resource persons. And regarding the, our resource person, 
of the international webinar professor professor michael north is a great personality and reputed academician he published enormous articles and completed he completed more than enormous projects and received own awards and prizes his department that is the green chemistry group headed by the prof, professor james clark has about 60 academic staff including teaching fellows and a number of independent research fellows supported by the royal society in addition to that there are 38 experimental officers and technicians and 23 administrative and related staff working there there are over 70 research fellows are in that department uh, regarding the webinar the great chemistry also called sustainable chemistry is an area of chemistry and chemical engineering focused on the design of the product and processes that minimize or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. The ideology of green chemistry calls for the development of new chemical reactivates and reaction conditions that can potentially provide benefits for chemical synthesis in terms of resource as yet energy efficiency, product selectivity, operational simplicity, and health and environment. It's also an active revision of chemical synthesis and process to mitigate environmental footprint. Organic chemists are therefore essential for the success or implementation of green chemistry in the industry also. I take this opportunity to, to thank the, our respected principal or management and head and faculty members of the Department of Chemistry and the distinguished resource persons for having provided this platform to import knowledge about the, the latest trend of the green organic chemistry. I appreciate the faculty and the organizers of the Department of Chemistry who associate themselves with the dedication and supporting to organize this wonderful webinar. I pray the Almighty Allah and the webinar will be a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now, I am profusely overjoyed to take the opportunity to introduce our chief guest of the day. He is an Anna Fawzan Professor Michael Nath, is a professor of chemistry and a Green Chemistry Center of Excellence, Department of Chemistry, University of York, UK. He did his PhD, is a doctor of philosophy from Oxford University under Professor Sir J. E. Baldwin Research Group. And he's achieved and also to be an IC, IC, ICI research fellow at the University of Nottingham, working with the Professor G. Badentum at 1990. And he had awarded as a prize for the excellence in scientific research by the European Commissions. And also he awarded the Green Chemistry by RSC. He's working as a deputy chair of EPSRC, Grand Challenge Network and Carbon Dioxide Utilizations. And he is also been a working the visiting professor in University of Castilla La Mancha 2016 as Moscow. And he acts as a to be an editorial board member of ChemCat Chem. The publication is comes to be a Wiley. And also he has a 53 H index up to January 2021. He also well expert in the field of polymer chemistry, homogeneous catalysis, asymmetric synthesis, carbon dioxide chemistry green solvents, etc. He published more than 300 papers with repeated channels and also had the six patent rights. Now, I invite our chief guest, Professor Michael Nasser, to deliver the keynote address. Sir, please, sir. Thank you very much for the very kind introductions and for the invitation to, to come and give this presentation today. And uh, so it's good morning from the United Kingdom. I think it's probably good afternoon or good evening in, in India. So thank you all for staying to, to, to listen to me. Um, so I'm gonna talk today um, about various topics in, in green organic chemistry, but what they what they have in common really is, is carbon dioxide utilization. And I thought I'd start by just showing you a little bit about where I work and where I come from. So this, Orange building is the is the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence, um, and we are a grouping of about ninety people, and we work across the top floor of this building. And you can probably see through the windows that it's a very green building on, on the inside. To give you an idea as to to where I I come from, I'm I'm at the University of York, 
that's very different to the University of New York. Um, so I don't speak with an American accent. Uh, York is, is a historic city, which is about halfway between London and Edinburgh in, in the United Kingdom. And we have a very famous cathedral. These are some pictures of the university. And for those of you who have seen the Harry Potter films, then you may well recognize this street within York. It's officially called the Shambles, but it's better known as Diagon Alley. So it's a, ver a very historic uh, city, a, a fairly small city, and uh, you can walk across it in 20 or 30 minutes, but it's a very pleasant place to, to work. So I think any talk on green or sustainable chemistry really needs to start by thinking about what is sustainability? And I usually start with, with this slide showing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which were approved almost, um, well, what, six, six years ago now by almost all member states of, of the United Nations. And there are 17 sustainable development goals. And my view is that chemistry has a role to play in each and every one of them. But perhaps most significantly is if we look down in the bottom left hand corner, responsible consumption and production. Well, that definitely includes production and consumption of chemicals, climate action, very big role for chemistry, also affordable and clean energy and clean water and sanitation. And really, it's these four down here where green and sustainable chemists can perhaps make the most direct impact, but we can contribute to all of these. And a good starting point is to realize that the, the chemicals that the global chemicals industry is, is highly dependent upon are also, or so, certainly the organic chemicals, are sourced from oil and gas, crude oil and, and natural gas. So over 90% of all commercially available organic chemicals are sourced from crude oil. And crude oil is a resource that we are using up far faster than it can possibly be replenished. And every year, BP produces a statistical review of world energy. It usually comes out in early June. I was looking yesterday. This year's is slightly delayed until the 6th of July. So the, the most recent figures I can give you are a, are a year old. But nonetheless, the BP statistical review of world energy suggests that known reserves of oil will be consumed in 50 years. Known reserves of gas will be consumed in 50 years. And known reserves of coal will last for 132 years. And I suspect that many of the people in the audience hope to still be alive on this planet in 50 years time, which then begs the question, not only of what are you going to be driving and, and, what, and what fuel are you going to be burning, but where are the chemicals that you need to, to survive going to come from? And these predictions assume that consumption of fossil fuels remains constant at current levels. And in general, consumption of fossil fuels is increasing every year, although it will be interesting to see what's happened over the last year with the global pandemic and the uh, global lockdowns um, to see just how much um, consumption has dropped over the last 12 months. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that in the, in the BP statistical review. But the takeaway message is that we need an alternative sustainable starting material for the chemicals industry because oil and gas will not last forever. And my view is that carbon dioxide is itself a sustainable feedstock that you could base a chemicals industry around. And Really, for the younger people in the in the audience, then I think it's this generation, the people who are alive today, who have a big decision to make. Do you want to live on a planet that looks like the left hand side of this picture with completely barren and polluted atmosphere? Or do we want to tr make the transition to the right hand side of the picture using sustainable energy? and sustainable resources and living sustainably on, on the planet. And up till now, we've been living unsustainably throughout the Industrial Revolution. And I think it's the, the next generation who will, who will make the, the decision as to, to whether we, we stay. 
and I seem to have lost all the Zoom images. Can someone just confirm that you can still hear me? Hello, am I still audible? Yeah, sure, sir. Audio. Okay, good. It's just all the uh, all, all the Zoom images disappeared. I would have hated to spend the next hour talking to myself. Sure. Uh, so, if if I'm saying that carbon dioxide is a potentially sustainable um, feedstock, then where does waste carbon dioxide come from? And I showed you. I'm showing you on this slide, just. The, the main sources of waste carbon dioxide. And by far the biggest is the burning of coal in coal powered power stations. And that produces about 14,000 million tons of waste carbon dioxide every year. The next is burning natural gas in gas powered power stations. That's about 6,000 million tons uh, of waste carbon dioxide every year. But then the chemicals industry is itself a big producer of waste carbon dioxide in oil refineries, in cement production, ethylene production, iron and steel, natural gas production, and in ammonia production, which I've highlighted because its waste carbon dioxide is 100% pure and so should be very easy to use. But also available is you don't need a supplier of waste carbon dioxide nearby if you want to use carbon dioxide as a resource because the atmosphere will bring it straight to you free of charge with no delivery costs. And there's about three teratons of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere at a concentration. This slide's a little bit out of date. I think it's about 416 parts per million now. And it's really available to anyone who wants it anywhere on, on the planet. And in fact, we're putting so much carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere that it's starting to cause climate change. And so it's now becoming absolutely essential that we find something useful to do with this waste carbon dioxide, other than just dump it in, into the atmosphere. And there are really three possibilities that, that, we, that, we, are, that we can do um, to avoid putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The first is what's known as carbon capture and storage. And this involves capturing the carbon dioxide, preferably before it's released to atmosphere, piping it under high pressure to a suitable location, and then storing it underground in depleted oil deposits, in geological um, features, or in depleted natural gas fields. And this could be good for the environment, because it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but it will always be very bad for the profit of any process because there is no product that you can sell. It costs a lot of money to purify and pressurize carbon dioxide and then to transport it long distances. And that will always hurt the profit of whatever you're trying to make. And therefore this is not very sustainable because it treats carbon dioxide as a waste material. Even worse, I've shown in red, is what's called enhanced oil recovery, or EOR. And in this case, you again capture the waste carbon dioxide, you pressurize it, you transport it, but you now pump it down a partially depleted gas or oil well, and you use that carbon dioxide to force more oil or more gas out of the well. Now that, of course, is very good for profit because you're making a very valuable uh, resource, crude oil, which you can sell, but it's potentially very bad for the environment because when you burn that crude oil, of course, you generate even more carbon dioxide. And this is potentially a very dangerous pyramid scheme. And in the middle, I've shown the green alternative, which is carbon capture and utilization, CCU, or carbon dioxide utilization, CDU, they are the same thing. And this treats carbon dioxide as a resource, as a feedstock. It's good for the environment because you're doing something with the carbon dioxide other than dumping it into the atmosphere. And it's also potentially good for profit because you're making a product from it that you can sell. 
So this is where CCU fits into the uh, in, into the idea of helping to prevent climate change. But there's a, there is a problem. And the problem is that the market size for chemicals is actually not that big. So I've shown on this slide some of the larger scale chemicals that you could conceivably make from carbon dioxide. And perhaps the most obvious is carbon monoxide. And the amount we need of that every year is about 344 million tons. Ethene, ethanol, urea, methanol, inorganic carbonates. And if you add them all up and you look at the percentage of the waste carbon dioxide that they would utilize, you will see these numbers are not very high. They're only 1% to 2% or even less. And in fact, it turns out that if you made every chemical that's conceivably makeable from carbon dioxide, from carbon dioxide, then the amount of, of CO2 that you would need is only between four and 5% of what is emitted each year. So not a lot. But there is an alternative, and that's to make not chemicals from carbon dioxide, but fuel. And making fuel from carbon dioxide is something that's already fairly well established. Um, so it's been known since the 19th century that you can make that you can hydrogenate carbon dioxide to methane. This is the so-called Sabatier process. And that gives you effectively natural gas. You can also hydrogenate carbon dioxide to methanol. This is now a commercial process. And from methanol, you can either use the methanol to olefins technology to make petrol and diesel, or you can dehydrate methanol to make dimethyl ether, which is a drop in replacement for diesel. And a third option is that you can go from carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide and then hydrogenate that through Fischer-Tropsch chemistry, you can again get to petrol and diesel. So this is actually all very well established chemistry. Um, there's not, not a lot new needed and potentially all fuel could be made from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And this would utilize the other 95% of waste carbon dioxide emissions. And Therefore, people often say to me, well, doesn't it make sense then to just concentrate on making fuel from carbon dioxide and forget about the chemicals because they're going to, the fuel is going to solve 95% of the problem? And the answer is no, because if you look at what happens in a current petrochemical refinery, then what you find is that of the crude oil that comes in, then about 70% of that crude oil gets, gets converted into transport fuel. And about 26% gets co converted into non-transport fuel. And that leaves just between three and 4% that gets converted into chemicals. But that three to 4% that gets converted into chemicals is responsible for over 40% of the profit of the oil refinery. And so making chemicals is financially a very sustainable thing to do. An oil refinery does not make much money out of making fuel. Most of the money comes from making chemicals, even though that's something that they do on a relatively small scale compared to the production of, uh, of, of the fuel. And that brings me to a concept that I published two years ago now of the idea of a carbon dioxide refinery, where we would take impure waste carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, use carbon capture to capture that carbon dioxide, and convert it into pure carbon dioxide. And then the vast majority of that pure carbon dioxide would be combined with renewable hydrogen from water, from water splitting to generate fuel. And about 50% of the profit would come from doing that. A much smaller amount, about 5% of the pure carbon dioxide, you can combine with renewable feedstocks from waste biomass to make a wide range of chemicals that we, that we need to continue uh, living. 
and that provides the other 50% of the product. And the takeaway message is that only by making both fuel and chemicals together can a, re a, a carbon dioxide refinery be both financially sustainable and environmentally sustainable. If you only make fuel, you will be financially sustainable, but you won't. So, so you won't be financially sustainable, though you'll be good for the environment. And if you only make chemicals, then you will be financially sustainable, but you won't have much impact on, on the environment. So let's just look then at the chemicals that you can make from carbon dioxide. And perhaps the, the best established, certainly on a large scale, is making urea from ammonia and carbon dioxide. And this is a very well-known process. It's been commercialized since the 1920s. And if you notice, it's an exothermic reaction. So this reaction goes essentially spontaneously at just over 100 degrees C. An even older process is the reaction between phenols and carbon dioxide uh, to make salicylic acids. And this is the first step in the industrial synthesis of aspirin. And again, it's an exothermic reaction. And I've put a third example on this slide, which is the reaction between carbon dioxide and ethene to make acrylic acid. I've shown this in red because this is not yet commercial, but this is being highly looked at by a number of big chemical companies as an alternative way of making what is, of course, a precursor to plastics um, from, again, from carbon dioxide. And again, note, this is a highly exothermic reaction. So there are plenty of reactions of carbon dioxide that you can do, which would utilize the carbon dioxide, which would make useful and valuable chemicals and which are potentially exothermic. Now, the particular reaction that we're interested in is the reaction between carbon dioxide and epoxides to make cyclic carbonates. And this again is a highly exothermic reaction. It gives out about 140 kilojoules per mole. And that most of that, of course, is because you are releasing all the ring strain in this three-membered ring epoxide. And this is already a commercial process. It was first commercialized in the 1950s in America. But all the commercial processes, even today, use high temperatures and high pressures of highly purified carbon dioxide and they also use corrosive halide-based catalysts, which mean they need to use special grades of stainless steel within the, within the reactor. But nonetheless, this is a very important reaction because the cyclic carbonates that you make have important applications. And perhaps the single most important application is that they are used in the electrolytes in lithium-ion batteries. And lithium-ion batteries literally power the world these days most of you are probably listening to me thanks to a lithium ion battery at the moment, because every mobile phone, every iPad, every laptop computer is powered by lithium ion batteries. And we are increasingly starting to move towards electric vehicles. And again, they run on, on lithium ion batteries. So this is a huge growth area. Um, the, we're seeing a huge increase in, in demand for lithium ion batteries, and that translates into a huge increase in demand for the cyclic carbonate electrolytes. And our contribution to this area started over 10 years ago when we developed an aluminium based catalyst for making cyclic carbonate. So we reasoned that because the synthesis of cyclic carbonates is exothermic, there should be no need to operate these, temp these processes at high temperature and high pressure. And a suitable catalyst should enable the reaction to go at or close to room temperature and atmospheric pressure, and that would significantly reduce the energy that you need to put into the reaction. And what we found was that we could take this commercially available sail and ligand, we could just complex it to aluminium, and we used aluminium foil and a bit of iodine in ethanol, do an aqueous workup, and what you get is a bimetallic catalyst, which I'm going to call catalyst one, with two aluminiums, each of which has a sail and ligand attached to it, and they're connected via an oxygen bridge. And we know exactly what the structure is because we got the crystal structure. 
the show no over here and you can see the aluminiums in green the bridging oxygen here in red and then around each aluminium there is a a sail and ligand and here is what this catalyst will do it lets us take any mono substituted epoxide we've ever tried with carbon dioxide at one atmosphere pressure and we just use a balloon at room temperature, and this is room temperature in the UK, not in India, so it's probably around 20 degrees C. But in three hours, without needing any solvent, in the presence of our catalyst one and tetributyl ammonium bromide as a co-catalyst, we can convert these epoxides into the corresponding cyclic carbonates in pretty good yields. And importantly, we've looked at both ethylene oxide and propylene oxide and these are two of the best substrates, and these are the two which are commercially most important. So about 90% of the world demand is for ethylene carbonate and about 9% for propylene carbonate. We did a lot of work to work out the reaction mechanism. And essentially, if you start up here with the aluminium salon complex, this bimetallic complex, then it will, it, the aluminiums are five coordinates, so they still have a, a vacant site, so they are Lewis acidic. You can imagine the aluminium complexing to the epoxide to form a complex like this. And then the tetributyl ammonium bromide provides bromide as a good nucleophile to ring open the complex epoxide to form an aluminium bound bromo alkoxide. And one of the things we discovered is that under the reaction conditions, the tetrabutyl ammonium bromide also decomposes to tributylamine and butyl bromide. This is the reverse uh, uh, anyway, it, it, it decomposes to tributylamine and, and, but, and butyl bromide. The tributylamine can then react with carbon dioxide to form what would normally be a very unstable carbamate but that can be stabilized by complexation to the second aluminium. So we're making use of both metals within the, within the complex. And then we can form the carbonate bond intramolecularly rather than intermolecularly. And this is why we think this catalyst is so good. It lets us do the key chemistry intramolecularly to form this aluminium bound carbonate, which can then just snap shut with elimination of bromide to form the cyclic carbonate. That's homogeneous catalysis. So the next thing we did was then to convert this catalyst into a heterogeneous catalyst by immobilizing it onto silica. And we also took the opportunity to covalently link the quaternary ammoniums to the CLN so that we had a one component catalyst that didn't need anything else adding. So here's silica. Down at the bottom, we covalently link through a quaternary ammonium to make this CLN complex, which now has the quaternary ammonium salts covalently linked to it. And what this allowed us to do was then design and build a gas phase flow reactor in which we could immobilize the silica supported catalyst within a stainless steel tube, which we hold in an oven. And then we can pass through that stainless steel tube a mixture of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and ethylene oxide. And as that mixture passes through the stainless steel tube in the presence of the catalyst, it gets converted into ethylene carbonate, which comes out as a liquid, and we can very easily isolate that. So we've got three gases reacting to give a, a liquid product. And here's a typical set of, of results. And if you notice, whoops, First of all, just look at the uh, horizontal axis on this. This is time in hours, and we're going up to 168 hours. So this is actually over eight days of having the flow reactor running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So a very efficient way of doing chemistry. And you can see that over the course of about the first week, the catalyst loses about half of its activity. And what's happening here is that we're losing alkyl groups off the quaternary ammoniums and that's causing deactivation because it's taking the bromide away. But if we just requaternize those amines with benzyl bromide, then we get all of our catalytic activity back again. 
So everything I've told you about so far has been done using very pure carbon dioxide from a cylinder, a cylinder that's supplied at high pressure. And we really wanted to get away from needing that because if you have to pressurize and transport cylinders of carbon dioxide, then from a green chemistry point of view, really you failed before you start because you put so much energy in to do that, that it's going to exceed the, 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 the value of the carbon dioxide that you're utilizing. So we wanted to look at using real waste carbon dioxide. So what we did was we made one large batch of catalyst and we split it into five. And one batch in blue never left our lab. And the other four batches we took to a power station test facility that I'll show you in a minute. And we exposed those to real flue gas from burning either natural gas or burning coal for up to 16 hours. And then we brought the catalyst back to my lab and we tested them. And this is the, uh, a diagram of the test facility that we took the catalyst to. And this is operated by a company called Doosan Power Systems in, in the UK. Now, unfortunately, there is no scale on this diagram, but this burner, and you can see the flame at the top here, this burner is actually the size of a three-story building. So this is not small-scale chemistry. This hopper up here contains the coal, which is allowed to drop into the furnace where it's burnt and the gases come out at the bottom and if you follow the pipe work round it, it's absolutely dotted with sensors so gas analyzers to analyze the composition of the gases this unit is an electrostatic precipitator which just takes any remaining coal dust out and then here is a fan which is just used to blow the flue gas up a chimney and what Doosan very kindly did was let us drill a hole in their chimney and stick a tube in. And we were able then to siphon off the flow, the flue gas at, with a flow rate of about 20 mils a minute. We know exactly what its composition is because of all these gas analyzers. So we know it was 15% carbon dioxide, still contained 3% oxygen. We know it contained some SO2, some carbon monoxide and some, some NOx. And we also analyzed the coal that was being used. So it was Elkrogen coal from South America, 74% carbon, half a percent sulfur, and, and so on. And after exposing our catalyst to that flue gas for up to 16 hours, we brought them back to our lab and we were delighted to find that the activity of the catalyst was completely unchanged. So all the impurities in the flue gas had absolutely no effect whatsoever on the uh, activity of the catalyst. And in particular, all the water that's present didn't destroy it. So essentially no difference in activity between the activity of the control sample that never left our lab and the worst case scenario of exposing that catalyst to flue gas from coal burning for up to 16 hours. And then we went one step further and we said, well, do we need a source of carbon dioxide at all? Or given that there's carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, can we just use air? Now, it turns out we can't yet, we don't yet have a catalyst that's active enough to let us use air at one atmosphere pressure. So we do have to pressurize these reactions and we do them at 25 bar. That's largely actually just to make sure that we get enough carbon dioxide into the stainless steel uh, reactor. And we do these reactions not at room temperature, but at 50 degrees C. But then the answer is yes, we can again take terminal epoxides and we can react them with carbon dioxide now from compressed air. That's just slightly high pressure and, and temperature. And again, we can use that carbon dioxide at 410 parts per million to convert, to make the corresponding cyclic carbonate. And then we started collaborating with chemical engineers to commercialize this process. And the first thing they asked us to do was to look at a wider range of temperatures and pressures because um, chemical engineers, they like to make as much product as possible in as short a period of time as possible. So they like to put as much material as they can in, into the reactor. And so they said, well, what happens if you raise the reaction temperature? And you can see on the left hand graph, 
that at 25 degrees C, this reaction goes quite slowly. This is after six hours, it's gone about 10%. If you, if you heat it to 50 degrees C, then in five hours, it will go to over 60%. And if you heat to 100 degrees C, then it goes very quickly and it's gone to completion in probably about 30 minutes. Well, that's fa fairly well known. More interestingly, is what happens if you look at what happens if you pressurize the reaction to different pressures. And if you start off working at one atmosphere pressure, then the reaction is quite slow. Even a small amount of pressurization to five or to 10 bars makes it go a lot faster. The optimum is somewhere around 50 bar. And you can see that's going probably then about 50 times faster than the reaction at one bar. But if you go much over 50 bar, then the reaction rate drops off again very quickly. And at 100 bar, you get almost no reaction whatsoever. And you've got to realize what's happening here. We're not using a solvent. So the epoxide, which is a liquid, is itself the, the solvent for the reaction. And as you start to pressurize with carbon dioxide, you force carbon dioxide to dissolve within that epoxide. And the higher the pressure, the more CO2 that you force in. And the, the optimum is about 50 bar, where you presumably have about one carbon dioxide for every epoxide. So you've got the equal concentration of both. But if you go above 50 bar pressure, then what you start to get is what's called a gas expanded liquid, which is predominantly carbon dioxide and just has a small amount of the epoxide in it. And that lowers the concentration of the epoxide. And therefore, the rate of reaction goes down because you've lowered the concentration of your starting material. We were then able to do kinetics at 10 bar and 50 degrees C to measure these, the, these changes in rate constants more accurately. And this actually gave us quite a surprise. And I've shown on this graph the results for both varying the concentration of the catalyst and also varying the concentration of tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. And the main thing to note about this graph is that these straight lines do not pass through the origin. And that really surprised us. Now, it's not particularly surprising that the varying catalyst one, if you put no catalyst one in at all, that, that you still get some activity. And that's because it's known that commercially, this reaction is catalyzed by tetraalkyl ammonium salts. And we're here at elevated temperature and elevated pressure. So you can see that the, the quaternary ammonium salt by itself is capable of doing some of the catalysis. However, what really amazed us is that at this higher temperature and pressure is if we don't put any tetrabutyl ammonium bromide in the reaction, we still get some, some reaction. In other words, the catalyst is capable of catalyzing the reaction without needing the halide co-catalyst. So that's the prediction from the kinetics. We then carried out some preparative uh, experiments to show that that is indeed the case. We're now taking carbon dioxide between 10 and 50 bar. We're heating the reactions to between 50 and 100 degrees C. And we're adding our catalyst, but we are not adding any tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. And lo and behold, all of these reactions work and we can make the corresponding cyclic carbonate. And this is important because this now is a genuinely halide free system. There is no halide in our catalyst. There is no halide in the in the co-catalyst because we're not adding a co-catalyst. And therefore, that avoids all of the corrosion issues associated with using halide based catalysts. We then would say, well, how is our catalyst acting? And in particular, what's opening up the epoxide if we're not adding a halide? And to try and understand that, we resorted to using DFT calculations. And what they suggested is that when you expose our catalyst one to carbon dioxide, it ought to form an aluminium carbonate complex, which I've shown here as structure two, and suggested that this reaction, this would be favorable um, through a relatively low energy transition state and would have a favorable Gibbs free energy of reaction. And in, in fact, it turns out that catalyst, that complex two, is only metastable. This is not something that you can isolate and put on a bench and put in a bottle for a long time. But if you are very quick 
then we can isolate and detect complex two by mass spectrometry, by infrared spectroscopy, and by proton NMR spectroscopy. And the other thing that the DFT calculations indicated is that complex two is more Lewis acidic and hence should be more catalytically active than complex one that it's derived from. And on the basis of that and some other experiments, and um, particularly studying the stereochemistry of the reaction, then we were able to put together this catalytic cycle for how the, the process goes in the absence of a halide. So again, you start with complex one, it reacts with carbon dioxide to form this aluminium carbonate. The aluminiums are now more Lewis acidic, so one of them complexes to the epoxide. And now you can very nicely ring open this epoxide using the carbonate bridge in an intramolecular process to make an aluminium bound carbonate of, of this sort. And from here, it has a choice. It can either use this alkoxide bound to aluminium to come back in, re close onto the carbonyl, and that gives you the cyclic carbonate. And you would see overall inversion of stereochemistry from this cis epoxide, you would get the trans cyclic carbonate. Or because we're at high pressure, another carbon dioxide can insert into this aluminium oxygen bond to form a bicarbonate of this sort, which can then ring close now onto the stereo center here. And what that gives you is a second inversion. And so you met the cyclic carbonate with overall retention of stereochemistry if you've got substituents on both carbons. And what we see experimentally is that you get a one-to-one -one mixture of the cis and the trans. So it looks like both of these processes are going on and are going on at about the same rate. And that's all I want to say about cyclic carbonate synthesis, other than to say that all of this technology is now patented and it's all licensed to a European company. And they are in the process of, well, they've done all the chemical engineering and all the process engineering that needs to be done. And they're now raising the money needed to build the first full scale commercial plant. And we're hopeful that we will have the money we need by the end of this year, and we'll then be able to build a full scale commercial plant using my catalyst next year to start commercial production, probably the year after. So that's exciting prospects for the future. And I want to move on now and, and talk for a little while, not about cyclic carbonates, but about oxazolidinones. And oxazolidinones are very much like cyclic carbonates, in, except one of the oxygens in the ring is replaced by a nitrogen. And the nitrogen can obviously have, have a substituent on it. And Oxazolidinones, just like cyclic carbonates, are commercially important, but they tend to be commercially important because they're found in, pharma in pharmaceuticals. And I've shown you four examples on this slide. Three of them have uh, antimicrobial activity. And the fourth one, tolox toloxetone, is, a, is an antidepressant. And you'll also recognize oxazolidinones as being present in the Evans chiral auxiliary for asymmetric synthesis. And there are numerous ways in which you can make oxazolidinones. I've just highlighted three on this slide. The old fashioned way and the way no green chemist would ever do is to take a beta amino alcohol with phosgene and make the, uh, the oxazolidinone that way. We in the past, which I'm not going to talk about today, have looked at the reaction between epoxides and isocyanates to make oxazolidinones. The route I am going to tell you a little bit about because it nicely uh, compares with the epoxide chemistry I've just been talking about is the reaction between azuridines and carbon dioxide, which also leads you, leads you to oxazolidinones. And all of this chemistry on oxazolidinone synthesis was all done in, in my group by one very good Indian postdoc who came from to me for just 12 months with SERB funding. And he'd done his PhD on, on azuridine chemistry. So he knew how to make azuridines on a, on a good scale and, and very quickly and very efficiently. And he wanted to look at their reaction with carbon dioxide. So the first thing he did was to screen all the catalysts that we'd made 
for cyclic carbonate synthesis. And one of them was this catalyst I've shown here as, as compound four. And he found that this was actually the best catalyst for making uh, oxazolidinone. So all the results on oxazolidinone synthesis are all done with this bimetallic ca catalyst. And what he was able to, 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 to show was that if you take an aziridine with carbon dioxide at one atmosphere pressure, and you use one and a half more percent of, of this aluminium catalyst. And again, you don't need a co-catalyst. In this case, it has aluminium chlorine bonds. Then at 50 degrees C, you can convert your aziridine into the corresponding oxazolidinone. And this time we need to worry about the regiochemistry because the carbon dioxide can insert into the more hindered or the less hindered end of the aziridine. And what we tend to find is in every case, we, pre we got, get predominantly CO2 insertion into the more substituted end of the aziridine. And he did a whole range of different aziridines, looking at different steric effects and different functionalities. And of course, this is a bit more complicated than making cyclic carbonates, because we now have substituents on both carbon and nitrogen that need varying. And that's what he did. He looked at a range of substituents on nitrogen and a range of substituents on carbon. And in every case, he was able to get a good yield um, of the corresponding ox oxazolidinone. We then showed that this reaction, that this chemistry is scalable. You can't just do this on one on 100 milligrams or a couple of 100 milligrams. So we scaled this up and we looked at using over four grams of azuridine in, in one reaction. And that works fine. We were still able to get a 96% yield. And we also showed that although this is a homogeneous catalyst, it can be re-isolated and reused. If you add acetonitrile to the reaction mixture at the end of the reaction, the catalyst will precipitate out. So you can filter it off and then you can reuse it with a different aziridine and you can then make a different oxazolidinone. So the recovered catalyst retains its catalytic activity. We then did the total synthesis of one of these pharmaceuticals, just really to show just how versatile this chemistry is. And this took quite a long time to work out what, what worked. We tried a lot of things that didn't. But essentially, we found this route starting from glycidol acetate. You can react that with 3-methyl aniline. And that ring opens the epoxide. And then you can do a Mitsunobu type reaction with triphenylphosphine and bromine to ring close to make this aziridine with an, uh, an O-acetate group on here. At this stage, we were able to cleave the acetate protecting group with sodium hydroxide to give us the free alcohol. And then in the last step of the synthesis, then we were able to use our catalyst with carbon dioxide and these are optimized conditions for this substrate, so slightly higher pressure and 100 degrees C, and we were able to come up with this really very short synthesis of toloxetone, um, in which carbon dioxide is used to insert this carbonyl in, into the oxazolidinone unit. We were also able to show that this chemistry can be extended. It will work with tri-substituted aziridines as well, um, so now we have two substituents on carbon and one on the nitrogen, and we looked at three examples of this with a five or a six membered ring, and for one of them we were able to get the crystal structure to prove that if we start with the cis aziridine, we end up with the cis oxazolidinone, as shown, shown down here. And then we did some fairly extensive mechanistic studies because we were puzzled by the fact that we were getting reaction at the more hindered end of the aziridine, but with complete retention of stereochemistry. And first we did a Hammett plot, and a Hammett plot came out to be a, a, a nice straight line with a slope of minus two. And that really confirms that there is this buildup of positive charge at the benzylic position. So we were doing these on a substrate with, with a, a benzene ring on, on here. But if it was a full SM1 reaction, the slope would be closer to minus four than minus, than minus two. So we're looking at buildup of a partial positive charge, not a full positive charge. 
And then, as I mentioned, we looked in detail at the stereochemistry using this deuterated aziridine. And we were able to show that if we started with the trans aziridine, then whether the carbon dioxide inserts into the more substituted or the less substituted end of the aziridine, we get, we got both products, but in both cases, the product has the trans stereochemistry. So trans is going to trans, there is no epimerization, which you would expect from an SM1 reaction. So the catalytic cycle that we came up with, starting from our aluminium catalyst, you can displace the chlorine with the nitrogen lone pair of aziridine. So the aluminium is acting as a, as a Lewis acid again, this time coordinating to the aziridine. And when it does that, it weakens the carbon nitrogen bonds of the aziridine. And in particular, it weakens the carbon nitrogen bond to the more substituted carbon because that's the one that's better able to support the partial positive charge. So then chloride is attracted to ring open by an SN2 mechanism, but at the more hindered end of the aziridine. That gives you an aluminium bound amide, which can react with carbon dioxide to form a carbamate, which then just ring closes again by with inversion of stereochemistry to form the oxazolidinone. So that's another brief aside into oxazolidinone chemistry, showing that uh, epoxides are not the only substrates that we can react with carbon dioxide. We can use aziridines as well. But what I want to do just to finish off this presentation is to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing with cyclic carbonates and looking at using them as, as solvents. And in particular, if you think about it, for most chemical reactions, the solvent is the main thing that you add to the reaction, and therefore it's the main source of waste at the end of the reaction. I'm sure you all work in laboratories where you have big bottles full of waste solvents, or virtually all chemistry generates large amounts of, of waste solvent. And therefore, if you want to be green and avoid waste, the first thing you need to do is to make the solvent, if you have to use a solvent, as green as possible. And a lot of industrial chemistry is carried out in polar aprotic solvents, such as DMF or di dimethyl sulfoxide. And that's because they're, they're very good at stabilizing polar transition states, and they're also very good at dissolving lots of different chemicals. But conventional polar aprotic solvents have serious problems associated with them from a green chemistry point of view. The first is toxicity. Acetonitrile is highly toxic. It's similar to hydrogen cyanide on, on risk assessments. HMPA is carcinogenic. And the real worry, at least in Europe, is that DMF and NMP are both reprotoxic, so they're toxic to unborn children, and they're in the process of being banned under the EU's REACH regulation. Now, DMSO, by contrast, is actually not toxic at all, um, but its synthesis is very ungreen. This is how it's made at the bottom of this slide. It's a byproduct of the wood pulping industry, and you end up generating large amounts of carbon dioxide, large amounts of sulfur-containing gases, such as dimethyl sulfide and hydrogen sulfide, and then you end up generating nitrogen oxides as well. So it's really not a very environmentally friendly synthesis. And the other thing to note is that all of these conventional polar aprotic solvents contain either nitrogen or sulfur. So if you incinerate your waste solvent when you finish using it, then that's going to generate nitrogen and sulfur oxides, NOx and SOx. So again, bad for the environment. And so we. We, we wondered, could we use cyclic carbonates as polar aprotic solvents? Because they only contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And in fact, when you look at their physical properties, it turns out that cyclic carbonates are actually extremely polar molecules. And so on this slide, I've shown you some of the physical properties for conventional polar aprotic solvents in black, contrasted with water as a very polar protic solvent in green. And then in red, I've shown you two, the two simpler cyclic carbonates, ethylene carbonate, where R is hydrogen, and propylene carbonate, where R is a methyl group. And 
the first thing you can do is you can look at the dipole moment within the molecule, and you can see that all of the polar A proteins, they all have a dipole moment of between three and five and a half. And sure enough, the two cyclic carbonates also have dipole moments of either just under five or just over five. The dipole moment is a measure of the polarity within an individual molecule. You can also look at the dielectric constant, which is a measure of the polarity of the bulk liquid. And you can see that most of the conventional polar A proteins have dielectric constants of between 30 and 50, which is high, but doesn't compare that well with water at 80. Well, ethylene carbonate has a dielectric constant of 90. It's higher than water. And even propylene carbonate has a dielectric constant of 64, which is higher than any of these conventional polar A proteins. And the other thing to note is the extremely wide liquid range associated with propylene carbonate. Because it freezes at minus 49 degrees C, it doesn't boil until 242 degrees C. So you've got almost 300 degrees C that allows you to do reactions from effectively about minus 50 degrees C all the way up to about 250 degrees C. And finally, propylene carbonate is known to be completely non-toxic. It's not toxic to humans and it's not toxic to the environment because it gets hydrolyzed to propylene glycol, which then your body can oxidize or can be environmentally oxidized to lactic acid and you know what to do with lactic acid. So it's perfectly safe from that point of view. In fact, it's so safe, it's actually licensed for use in cosmetics. So I want to show you two pieces of work that we've done on using cyclic carbonates then as replacements for conventional polar aprotic solvents. And the first thing we did about, about 10 years ago now was to look at using cyclic carbonates as solvents for proline catalyzed aldol reactions. And this was the time about 10 years ago where every issue of every organic chemistry journal was full of work on organocatalyzed aldol reactions. And we were really attracted to the idea of using S-proline, so just the natural amino acid as a catalyst. No need to do any chemistry on it. Nature provides that. The aldol reaction itself is 100% atom economical, so there's no waste. So this looks like the ideal green chemistry. And what, the, what we found is that when you go to the literature, because this was all being developed by organic chemists, they tended to use either DMF or DMSO as the reaction solvent. So we looked at what happens if you just change the DMSO to cyclic carbonate. And we found we had to add one equivalent of water as well, just to dissolve the, the proline. And then in, at room temperature after 24 hours, we found that these reactions go just as well as they go in a conventional organic solvent. And here's some examples. So in, um, in this case, we're looking at four nitrobenzaldehyde. So the aryl group here is four nitrophenyl. And here's just the examples, the results in both propylene carbonate and in ethylene carbonate. And you can see the reaction actually goes better in ethylene carbonate. We get 92% yield a nine to one ratio of the anti to syn diastereomer and 98% enantiomeric excess for the major anti diastereomer. And those results are at least as good, if not better than the published results in DMSO. But propylene carbonate has another interesting feature associated with it because very unusually for a solvent, it has a chiral center. There's a stereo center here, where the R group attaches to the, to the ring, that's a stereocenter, and therefore in principle, <coughs> propylene carbonate can be a chiral molecule. And we were able to obtain samples of both racemic, but also enantiomerically pure propylene carbonate, and we tested both as solvents for the reaction. And in this case, I'm showing you the results with four trifluoromethylbenzaldehyde. And at the top, you've got the results using S-proline, so chiral catalyst in the racemic solvent. And this particular substrate gives a 49% yield, five to one ratio of diastereomers. 
and still a very good 93% in antimeric excess for the major antidiastereomer. What we then did was say, well, we'll use an antimerically pure R-propylene carbonate instead. And if you use the SN antimer of proline again, what you find is that this is a, a bit of a disaster. This is a mismatched pair. So now you find the chemical yield goes way down to 26%. You only get a three to one ratio of diastereomers. The EE is still pretty good for the major diastereomer. But nonetheless, the, the, the yield and the diastereo selectivity have gone down. If you use the R enantiomer of proline in R propylene carbonate, then this is the matched pair. And now you get a higher yield than if you do the reaction in racemic propylene carbonate. You get a higher diastereo selectivity and you get a higher enantio selectivity. And interestingly, you also get a much higher enantio selectivity for the minor sin diastereomer. And then we said, well, OK, if we're using a chiral solvent, what happens if we put racemic proline in? Well, the reaction still goes. You still get a 43% yield, so not much change there. You get about a 6 to 1 ratio, diastereomeric ratio, so not much change there. And interestingly, we did see some asymmetric induction, but not much. So only between 6 and 9% asymmetric induction, but nonetheless, it tells you that the chiral solvent itself is having some impact directly on the reaction. But interestingly, none of these results in chiral or racemic propylene carbonate beats the re reaction in ethylene carbonate, which is achiral. That gives you a higher yield, a higher diastereo selectivity, and the highest enantio selectivity for the major antidiastereomer. But no, you can do reactions in either racemic or, or, or an antimerically pure propylene carbonate. And then more recently, and just to, to finish off this presentation, we've been looking at using cyclic carbonates and indeed various solvents I'm going to show you as replacements for the polar aprotic solvents used in peptide synthesis. And peptides are very important medicines. There are currently over 60 peptide-based medicines approved for use by the FDA. There's about another 140 in clinical trials and over 500 in preclinical trials. And the peptide medicines market is currently worth about 14 billion US dollars and is predicted to grow to 25 billion US dollars. But the synthesis of peptides is a very ungreen process partly because you need a polar aprotic solvent and partly because of all the auxiliary groups, all the protecting groups that you need to use and all the additives and coupling agents and bases and everything else, it generates vast amounts of waste. And I've shown that at the top of this slide where everything shown in red is, is waste that doesn't end up in the final product. But typically solvent is about 90% of the waste. So is there a greener alternative than running these reactions in DMF or NMP? And we got interested in the idea initially of could we use propylene carbonate as the solvent to do peptide synthesis in? And the short answer, at least if you stick with Merrifield resin, so cross-linked polystyrene, is no. And the reason is that it doesn't swell the resin. So in this photograph, I'm showing you what happens if you take beads of Merrifield resin and you swell them in, in DMF, you can see you get a volume of about half a mil. If you take those same beads and you swell them, or you try and swell them in propylene carbonate, you only get a volume of about 0.2 of a mil. So they're not swelling as well as they do in DMF. And because the beads don't swell, then the active site within the beads doesn't get exposed. And so you don't get any peptide synthesis going on. And in fact, we then screened a whole range of green solvents for their ability to swell Merrifield resin. And you can see on here that propylene carbonate and ethylene carbonate are, are very poor. Some solvents like gamma valerolactone, dimethyl carbonate, diethyl carbonate were OK. 2-methyl THF was really good. Um, but you're trying to compete with the NMP, the DMF, and the dichloromethanes um, shown here on the right. And 
we did look at some of these other goodish solvents, so particularly 2-methyl THF and diethyl carbonate, we found we could get the FMOC deprotections that you need to do within peptide synthesis to work in those solvents. But the coupling reactions failed because the reagents weren't soluble in them. So although they swell the resin, they, didn't dis they wouldn't dissolve the reagents. So we, we actually went away then and we did some work I'm not going to talk about today, saying, well, if, if, if Merrifield resin won't work, let's change the resin. So we did that and we showed that we could actually do solid phase peptide synthesis in propylene carbonate if we change the resin. But Merrifield resin is by far the cheapest and by far the resin that's available on the bigger scale. And so we really wanted to come back and say, well, what do we have to do? to be able to do solid phase peptide synthesis in green solvents on Merrifield resin. And we have not been able to find a single solvent, a single that I would consider to be green, that will swell Merrifield resin. So then I made the, the decision, well, if one solvent won't do it, what about two? Can we use mixtures of solvents instead to get us into solvent composition that there is no one green solvent that will do it and therefore we started quite a big study um, looking at the swelling of merrifield resin in various mixtures of two solvents and what we found somewhat to our surprise is that the amount of swelling that you get does not vary linearly with the composition of the solvent and I've shown you two examples of that on this slide. So on the left, you've got a mixture of cyclopentyl methyl ether and 2-methyl THF. And on the left-hand side, this is pure 2-methyl THF. And you can see it swells the resin very well to about 6.2 mils per gram. And on the right-hand side, you've got 100% cyclopentyl methyl ether, which also swells the resin quite well to over five and a half milliliters per gram. And you might expect this dotted line to represent what would happen if you start to use mixtures of the two solvents. But you can see from the experimental result that you get very big deviations away from that dotted line. And in particular, the swelling tends to be lower at most compositions than you would expect. And then on the right hand side of the slide, you can see the opposite. This is a mixture of propylene carbonate and acetonitrile. So on the left is pure acetonitrile, just under 2.5 mils per gram. On the right is pure propylene carbonate, about 2 mils per gram. The dotted line is what you might expect for mixtures of them. But what we actually see is you get a, a lot more swelling than, than is predicted, and you can get up to over 3 mils, mils per gram. So the swelling of the resin does not vary linearly with the, the solvent. And to try and understand that, we started using Hansen solubility parameters. And Hansen solubility parameters were developed about 50 years ago now, and they classify solvents according to three factors, their dispersion energy, their hydrogen bonding energy, and their dipolar energy. And on this slide, in this graph, in these three dimensions, I've shown the, the swelling of Merrifield resin in a range of different solvents. I think there's 26 solvents shown on shown in here, and I am plotted on, on their Hansen solubility parameters. And the color coding shows you the swelling of the resin. Black is no swelling, green is moderate swelling, and blue is a lot of swelling. Now, the only problem with this is you run out of solvents. We you can see we haven't covered much of the Hansen solubility parameter space. The solvents tend to cluster down towards the bottom of these three axes, and we really wanted to cover a lot more space. So if you start thinking now about using not single solvents, but mixtures of two solvents, then in Hansen's solubility parameter space, any mixture of two solvents will lie on the straight line connecting the two solvents in HSP space. And what that lets you do is suddenly put a lot more points on your graph. But before I do that, I want to show you how Hansen solubility parameter space also lets you understand why we see nonlinear swelling. 
And rather than worrying about this in three dimensions, I want to simplify it to two dimensions and just worry about the delta D and delta P parameters. So if I come back to this, I want you to imagine just taking a slice at a constant delta H through this graph. So probably down near the bottom here. And then we're just looking at a cross section across here. It just makes it easier to show that suppose you have a region of then Hansen solubility parameter space within which the resin will swell. And I've shown that as this blue shaded area. Then you can immediately see that if you have a mixture of two solvents, A1 and A2, which are on opposite sides of this resin swelling area, then some mixtures will come into the resin swelling area. So you would expect your resin swelling to go through a maximum and then come back down again. Alternatively, if you have a situation, as I've shown with line B, connecting solvents B1 and B2, both of which fit within the high resin swelling area, but the line leaves the high resin swelling area, then there should be some mixtures that go lower than you would expect. And of course, there are other possibilities. You can have two solvents, one inside and one outside, and then you'd expect to see either a linear or a nonlinear increase in resin swelling as you go from C2 to C1. You can have two solvents which are nowhere near the resin swelling area, and they shouldn't swell it at all. And you can have two solvents both inside the resin swelling area, D1 and D2, and the line stays inside, and then you'd expect to see good resin swelling at all mixtures. And this is what we see. And if you look on the left hand side, then you can see that immediately that we've got a lot more data points. They still do tend to cluster towards the bottom, but that turns out to be something we can't do a lot about. There aren't enough solvents up here that we can uh, get different uh, points from them. But you can immediately see now that these point, these dot circles do all lie in straight lines. So Here's one mixture of solvents across here, and you can see some others across here and across here. So lots of straight lines. And again, they're color coded as to their swelling. Now, I don't know about, about you, but I find these three dimensional plots very difficult to see. So what we developed within my group was to in start instead plotting these, uh, instead of these three dimensional um, cubic plots, we can plot two dimensional trigonal plots so we've still got the three axes, but now they're on the three sides of a, an equilateral triangle. And now it starts to become much more clear that all of the red dots, so sorry, all of the blue dots, all do seem to cluster together. And the blue dots, remember, are high resin swelling for Merrifield resin. They all cluster together in this blue, sh in this shaded area. <coughs> and then the, the shaded area is surrounded initially by the green dots, which are just outside, and then by the black dots, which are, which are further away. So we can start to experimentally map out a high resin swelling area of, of Merrifield resin within HSP space. And what that allowed us to do was to identify specific mixtures of green solvents, which should be suitable for use in peptide chemistry, on Merrifield resin. Now, not all green solvents are suitable for use in peptide synthesis. For example, you can't use alcohols. But we did identify two potentially usable mixtures. And the first is a mixture of ethyl acetate and propylene carbonate. And on the left-hand side, I've shown you the experimentally observed resin, well, in Merrifield resin, mixtures of ethyl acetate and propylene carbonate. And you can see that ethyl acetate swells to just below four mils per gram. But if you put 10% of propylene carbonate in it, then the amount the swelling goes up to over 4.5 mils per gram. And then it starts to drop off again if you put more propylene carbonate in. And that fits with the triangular plot on the right hand side of this slide where you can see that the ethyl acetate itself is towards the edge of the Merrifield uh, re resin swelling zone. Propylene carbonate, the black dot at the other end of, the, of this line, is well outside. And what we're doing by putting a little bit of propylene carbonate into the ethyl acetate 
is just moving it a little bit more towards the center of the high resin swelling area. And the other mixture that we looked at is a mixture of propylene carbonate and a solvent called TMO. Now, TMO is a solvent that was developed within the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence. It's THF, but with four methyl groups added adjacent to, to the oxygen. And that makes it very nonpolar. And one of the interesting things we found about mixing propylene carbonate and TMO is that they are only miscible in certain proportions. And if you start with pure propylene carbonate over here, you can see it's, it's very bad at swelling Merrifield resin. It swells below two mils per gram. As you add TMO, the swelling gets better. And it comes up to the highest one we can measure is at when you've got 30% TMO in there, then we get up to three mils per gram. At that point, they become immiscible. And so I've shown the red squares here where we don't know what the uh, resin swelling is, we can't measure it. But when you then get back to 90% TMO and you add 10% propylene carbonate to that, then you're back into miscibility again. And that we can see it does swell very well to four mils per gram. And then pure TMO is, is almost, is, is as bad as, as pure propylene carbonate. So the swelling drops off again. And that fits again when you look at the triangular plot, um, Here's propylene carbonate again, outside of the resin swelling area. The three green dots that we can measure, again, are outside of the resin swelling area. But you can see the trajectory they're on. We've just clipped the edge of the high resin swelling area. And in fact, this 90-10 uh, mixture, which is homogeneous, is right on the boundary of the high resin swelling area before TMO itself, this black dot down here, is again outside of the high resin swelling area. And so we decided we'd look at all three compositions I've shown on this graph, 30% TMO, 40% TMO, and also 90% TMO. We wanted to look what would happen with an immiscible one. And to study this, we, we designed a simple tripeptide. So we're starting with commercially available FMOC phenylalanine on Merrifield resin, we can take the FMOC group off under standard conditions with 20% um, with piperidine. We can add the, first, the next amino acid using FMOC alanine, and we, we're doing this with HOBT and HBTU as the coupling agent. Then we take the FMOC group off the alanine. Then we add FMOC leucine. Then we take the FMOC group off, and then we take the tripeptide off the resin, and we simply measure how much peptide we, we, we make. And rather than percentage yields, which are not very reliable in this area, we're looking at the number of milligrams of tripeptide that we make per gram of resin. And the first thing you can see on this in this table is, is in pure propylene carbonate, which remember is very bad at swelling the resin, we get essentially no product, only eight milligrams. In ethyl acetate, which is a borderline good swelling solvent, 3.8 mils per gram, we get quite a good yield, 292 milligrams per gram of resin. But sure enough, in our 90-10 mixture, which brings it into the high resin swelling area, so that, that this mixture swells Merrifield resin to 4.6 mils per gram, we get, a, we get more tripeptide. The peptide synthesis works better. We get 307 milligrams. So that's looking at the first pair of solvents that I mentioned. The second pair we looked at is propylene carbonate and TMO. And again, TMO, just like propylene carbonate, really is a bad solvent for swelling Merrifield resin. We get no product whatsoever. But all three mixtures of TMO and propylene carbonate all work to some extent. And you can see that the 3070 mixture, which is homogeneous and miscible, that swells to about 2.9 mils per gram. We get 130 milligrams of tripeptide per gram of resin. At the other extreme, the 9010, which is also a miscible mixture, that swells the resin better, 3.8, and we get 124 milligrams per gram. 
but the best one actually turns out to be the immiscible mixture. The immiscible mixture of 4060 40, TMO propylene carbonate, we think swells to 3.8 mils per gram. We get 200 milligrams of tripeptide per gram of resin. So by choosing mixtures of two green solvents, we're able to do chemistry that we can't do individually in either of the two green solvents by itself. And that really brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I think I've been talking for a, about an hour and a quarter. And I wanted to leave some time for questions. So it just remains for me to thank the people who've done all of the work I've talked about today. Um, the cyclic carbonate synthesis was all started by a very talented Italian PhD student, Riccardo, and has then been carried on by a whole series of postdocs, um, Heisiel, uh, from Spain, Jose, who's from Spain and now has his own academic post, Xiao, who's a very good Chinese postdoc, who's actually still with me, um, and then various students, Chen Chuo and Ziang, um, have both contributed. I mentioned the oxazolidinone work was all done by a very good Indian postdoc, and, I, and that's uh, Dr. Mani Sengodan, who came to, to me for a year. He's now back in India. Um, Adrian Whitwood gets all of our crystal structures for us, and the DFT calculations that I talked about were done by Wilhelm Offermans in the group of Thomas Muller and Walter Leitner. And over the years, we've had money for this project from various sources. Uh, CO2 Chem, which I helped to run, has been very good to us. We've had European money. We've had UK money from the EPSRC and from the Royal Society. We've had Indian money from CERB and we've had international collaboration money from, from the Newton Fund. And that's all I have to, to, to say. So I'd like to just end by thanking you all for coming along today. Um, thank you for listening and I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I'm glad to see there's still, still 200 people here left here. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Now, this is for the questionnaire session. If anyone has any question, please raise your hand and then I just unmute for yourself. Or if you don't want to talk, feel free to type the question into the chat box and uh, I'm looking at that as well. Uh, participants, you can ask questions, you can type the questions in the chat box also. Uh, Professor Michael? Yes. Uh, as we know that uh, carbon dioxide is a thermodynamically stable and kinetically in it in many transformation. Uh, one of the processes uh, we convert the carbon dioxide to cyclic carbonate by non-directive conversion. So I have shown some of the carbonate that is ethyl carbonate or propylene carbonate. So have you tried with uh, glycerol carbonate and styrene carbonate? Uh, yes, we've we've done a whole range of different um, epoxides and those were certainly two of them. Um, styrene carbonate is actually the, the standard test uh, epox or styrene oxide is the standard test substrate that we use. So you can see on this slide right at the start, the very first thing we looked at is styrene oxide uh, that gives 62% yield, and glycerol is, is one we've always been a little bit, uh, so glycidol, um, the one under the, the two red boxes, that works as well. Um, that's quite a nice one to look at because of its OH group, so it's got some functionality in it. Um, 
So yes, carbon dioxide, it is thermodynamically stable. Um, the trick, therefore, is to get it to react with something that's thermodynamically much less stable, because of course what matters is the average um, energy of the starting materials and the average energy of the products. And so what we're doing here is reacting it with something strained, the epoxide or the azuridine, so that raises then the average energy of your starting materials and allows you to make a product which is itself thermodynamically very, very stable. Um, also, though, things like ammonia is actually quite a high energy compound. And so ammonia will react with CO2. So will aromatics. So will alkenes. And the, and the challenge for a lot of this chemistry is catalysis. It's that a lot of these reactions, it's not that the thermodynamics are unfavorable, you can see the delta H's, it's that there is a high activation barrier, that is a challenge therefore that chemistry can solve, and so you just need to develop a good catalyst, and you can start to make reactions go with carbon dioxide. Okay, thank you, sir. thank you. Um, because someone's asked in the chat, whether all the principles of green chemistry are followed. Um, that's an interesting question and probably quite a controversial one. Um, I think they, I think, well, but synthesizing compounds from CO2, whether all the principles of green chemistry are followed, I think that will very much depend upon the particular reaction that you're looking at. You should certainly analyze it. But if you look at what we're doing, um, then from a green chemistry perspective, we can use stably sourced epoxides. So you can now get, although most epoxides are made from petrochemicals, they can come from biomass as well. And we have looked at both fatty acid derived epoxides and also things like ethylene oxide these days can be made from bioethanol. The reaction is 100% atom economical, so there's no waste. We're using a catalyst. That's one of the principles of green chemistry. We've got no auxiliary agents. We've shown that, for instance, we, we, we can get away even from the co-catalyst. We're trying, we're trying to work as close to room temperature and atmospheric pressure as possible to avoid putting any energy in. We're not using a solvent, so again, there's no waste. Um, so I think we actually do a pretty good job of addressing the various 12, 12 principles of, of, of green chemistry. Um, in, within this reaction. Now, I'm not saying that would be true of every reaction of carbon dioxide, but it's certainly something that we've tried to follow. And moving on to the next question, there was someone asking about the necessity of using aluminium metal as catalyst, or can we use any other metal? Well, I would argue if you're going to use a metal, aluminium is the best one to use, because aluminium is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. And therefore, Again, thinking about this from a green chemistry and a sustainability point of view, it's the metal you really do want to use, and that's why we chose it. But actually, if you go to the literature, then there are lots of other metals-based catalysts for this system. So Arjun Clyde has done a lot of work on iron-based systems, and iron is probably the second best metal you could choose. Um, if, there are actually only six metals which are earth crust abundant, so earth crust abundant, we'll never run out of them. There's sodium and potassium in group one, calcium in group two, aluminium in group three, and then in the transition metals, there's titanium and iron. And just about all of those have been the basis of catalysts for cyclic carbonate synthesis. But actually what we are looking at at the moment and what we've now become interested in is developing catalysts which don't have any metal in them because the most sustainable metal is no metal and it turns out that we can make use of fen ligands so not salem but make it aromatic it's fen, and then the phenols themselves will act as bronsted acids and will catalyze the reaction so we can do metal free or um, cyclic carbonate synthesis as well um if you compress carbon dioxide beyond a certain pressure it may become solid co2 does this make any impact on the kinetics or thermodynamics of the reaction um in fact at the temperatures we work at the co2 doesn't solidify it becomes uh, it will eventually become a supercritical fluid um and so 
we do have we do have a stainless steel reactor which has a has a window in it so we can see what's going on and we we don't go beyond 50 bar pressure and we're working at room temperature upwards and under those conditions um you go from gaseous co2 to a gas expanded liquid to liquid co2 and then to supercritical co2 um we we don't form solid co2 within the within the reaction can we use again the recycle catalyst for further reaction absolutely we've done that um over 30 times with the homogeneous catalyst so catalyst one shown on this slide we've filtered it we, we've we've isolated it at the end of the reaction just by distilling out actually the cyclic carbonate and then reusing it we did that 30 odd times and of course the immobilized catalyst we've put that in a flow reactor and just used it continuously for eight days and it still keeps going on and in fact we've run that a lot longer than the eight days um nabh4 bu slight confusion here sodium borohydride is a reducing agent tetrabutyl ammonium bromide is a is a quaternary ammonium salt it's not a reducing agent at all um so i'm not quite sure what that's uh what, what that's getting at sir i have to be in one more questions Sir, are you audible? Hello, sir. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sir, in your optimization table for the highlight free system, highlight free systems, mm -hmm. yeah, is how the short chain systems have to be a moderate yield comparatively the long chain system. So you mean in this table? Yeah, this guy is a highlight free system. The short chain system have to be in a some moderate yield comparatively to be in a some long chain systems. In the same, um, in the conditions having any reason, sir. Um, I'd have to have a look um, because, of course, we are varying the conditions. Both the, the, these are optimized for each substrate. So um, at the top, you've got methyl, butyl, and octyle, and the octyle is is the best, and also under the mildest conditions. But it's got a lot more catalyst in, so it's actually quite difficult from from this slide to 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 draw out trends like that. Um, and even if you look at the first two, the methyl and the butyl, they're the same amount of catalyst. I guess you would say the butyl is a lot better because it's at the lower pressure and it's giving a higher yield. So here we can work at lower pressure and still get more with the same amount of catalyst. The octyl, the yield goes up, but we've had to increase the amount of catalyst by a factor of five. And then the others all start to bring functional groups in. So um, I, I'm not convinced it's as simple as long alkyl chain short alkyl chain um it, these things really do boil down to how soluble everything is within the epoxide because you're using the epoxide as the solvent so the solubility of the catalyst is important the solubility of co2 is important um as well as the particular reactivity of the of of the epoxide thank you sir okay is there is any questions from the audience side? Sir, so shall I finish, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Professor Michael, no, sir. Sir, very okay. thank well, you. It was, a, spend... it, was a, it was a pleasure to come and. Uh... Hopefully, at some stage, I will be able to come and visit in person. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Meet you all. Uh, sure. Okay. It's a very pleasure sir, for your sharing my screen. And sharing. Uh, stop sharing. Stop. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Bye. As a token of appreciation of our guest speakers, the time to use a value of contributions.
and before we go into vote of thanks i'll share i'll share to be in a feedback link in the chat box and uh, participation is a fill to be in the feedback and send to back as soon as a possibility now may i request that i anthony jani sir assistant professor department of chemistry sarakatulappa college chennalveli to deliver the vote of thanks thank you dr imran uh, good evening everyone respected principal heads of the department faculty members from other colleges and research scholars students it is my great privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion first i should thank the god almighty for guiding us to conduct this webinar success full heartedly thank our honorable secretary al hsps patwani sir for his key interest and encouragement for his vision towards the growth of this institution i also thank our college management executive mem mem committee members for their kind support to organize the webinar i extend my sincere thanks to dr mohammad sadiq our principal for his enthusiastic support and guidance in conducting the webinar i think uh, uh, i think joining. some problem yeah he is joining you anthony sir uh, danish sir just un uh, unmute unmute yourself sir so you just unmute yourself do you so i think he is uh, some main problem okay and don't you continue yeah okay sir thank you and uh, sir thank you sir for your nice vote of thanks presentations and ladies and gentlemen may i thank you for your participation in the seminar i hope you enjoyed the program and i look forward to your participation in the future seminar i will say keep distance and be alert in your current situations assalamu alaikum and bye bye uh thank you professor thank you sir sir thank you sir uh thank you professor